Arachalineon, usted hoy está. Buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Bienvenidos, eh, señores y señores, a este Diálogos Europeos, Migrantes, Refugiados y la Libre Circulación en la Unión Europea. Eh, este evento es especialmente, eh, para mí, personalmente muy interesante. Yo misma soy un inmigrante a este país, eh, ciudadana de la Unión Europea de Grecia, y gracias a ese pasaporte estoy aquí con vosotros esta tarde. Eh, esta noche también tenemos gente que ha vivido experiencias eh, propias, eh, historias duras, y tenemos que entender que aunque esa, la crisis migratoria que está en las noticias todos los días y hablamos de política y de cuotas, el punto de partida es el ser humano. Son historias vividas y humanas. Entonces, esta tarde vamos a escuchar experiencias propias de gente que ha migrado a este país. Eh, con nosotros tenemos a Mario Rodríguez, a Abdelila Yenoni y a Meneses Bunge. La ponente esta tarde es Joana Anneke Rumens, nacida en los Países Bajos, pero trabajando actualmente en Canadá, con más de 25 años de experiencia en la investigación sobre la migración. La moderadora esta tarde es Nerea Magallón, profesora de Derecho Internacional en la Universidad de Deusto. Como siempre, eh, tenemos un artista de invitación esta tarde para conceptualizar todas las ideas habladas. Eh, con nosotros está Ángel López de Luzuriaga. Y para aportar sus visiones más objetivas, eh, tras la, el evento, en nuestro blog, en la página web, eh, que es en un apartado que se llama E-Diálogos, está Isabel Balinga, técnica en el programa de Centros Sociales de la Cruz Roja y licenciado en Derecho. Pues por parte del Instituto de Gobernanza Democrática Globernance, el Museo San Telmo y la Capitalidad Europea de Cultura 2016, eh, es un placer invitaros a participar esta noche, dialogar sobre ese tema tan importante, eh, por los que igual eh, no quieren participar en voz. Eh, nuestra moderadora Nerea va a estar siguiendo Twitter del proyecto, arroba EU Dialogues, eh, en inglés Dialogues, y podéis eh, enviarnos vuestras preguntas por los que están siguiendo por streaming. También estáis invitados a participar. Eh, el hashtag es EU Dialogues eh, también. Enviarnos, por favor, vuestras preguntas. Y con eso empezamos la tarde. Sí. Hola, buenas tardes. ¿Se oye bien? Bueno, gracias por venir. Eh, creo que el tema de hoy y el tema que nos presenta Caterina, en efecto, es un tema que nos, que nos influye a todos en la vida cotidiana del día a día, de nuestros vecinos, de nuestros compañeros de trabajo, de nuestros hijos, de la sociedad en general. Y creo que es importante lo que decía Caterina, que, que veamos los problemas que existen reales, eh, sobre, sobre todo de los inmigrantes que vienen a España, cómo se encuentran en una situación que para nosotros en ocasiones es nueva, porque ya estamos aquí, porque tenemos una serie de ventajas por ser ciudadanos europeos que no nos damos cuenta de que las tenemos, porque realmente nos movemos y tenemos una libre circulación a nivel europeo que nos hace que podamos ir con una facilidad que no nos damos cuenta al resto de los estados y que incluso podamos trabajar con una facilidad de la que no nos damos cuenta y, sin embargo, esa suerte no la tiene todo el mundo y no la tiene todo el mundo por el simple hecho de haber nacido en otro lugar. Simplemente no por ser mejor, peor, por haber estudiado más o menos. Vamos a ver cómo los, las personas que están aquí son personas formadas, que en su país han, se han formado, han, tienen igualmente que hemos tenido nosotros en la vida objetivos eh, laborales, objetivos profesionales, que se han ido poco a poco cumpliendo o no cumpliendo en función de cómo se encontraban en su situación social en sus países, que intentan eh, ser mejores personas en nuestro país y, y cómo, que, que, cómo, cómo lo han conseguido, si no lo han conseguido, con qué se están enfrentando para conseguir algo que nosotros realmente no nos damos cuenta que tenemos y que no es fácil alcanzar, pero que tenemos mayores facilidades que ellos simplemente por haber nacido donde hemos nacido. Eh, esa perspectiva, que es una perspectiva social importante, eh, va a estar también 
apoyada por una perspectiva más eh, académica, una socióloga eh, especialista en temas eh, de, de, no solo de inmigración, sino de, de, de cómo se encuentran los niños, los jóvenes, la, la, eh, cuando se integran en una determinada sociedad, los problemas a los que se encuentran, tiene una trayectoria amplia y nos va a dar una perspectiva, por tanto, más académica en ese sentido, que queremos que acompañe a la visión eh, personal que nos van a dar el resto de los, de los ponentes. Eh, en primer lugar, de una manera cortita, vamos a intentar que cada ponente que ha venido con, a participar aquí nos muestre cómo se ha encontrado, con qué problemas se ha encontrado a la hora de venir a España e intentar trabajar en España, intentar vivir, intentar hacer lo que todos intentamos hacer y, y, y por el hecho de ser de fuera, con qué problemas se han encontrado, que ya vais a ver que son muchos, que las trabas son continuas, que son verdaderos círculos viciosos, no tienes permiso, no tienes trabajo, no tienes trabajo, no tienes permiso, tienes que renovar la, 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 la tarjeta pero no tienes DNI, lo tienes caducado y entonces no puedes renovar el DNI porque no tienes, es todo un poco círculo vicioso y lo difícil y las dificultades a las que, a las que se enfrentan personas tan válidas como, como nuestros ponentes de hoy, a los que agradezco que hayan venido de verdad para contarnos su realidad, que a veces sin querer se nos escapa y deberíamos tener siempre presente. En primer lugar, eh, vamos a empezar por Mario, Mario Rodríguez, eh, lleva muchísimo tiempo en España, me contaba antes cinco años, tres en San Sebastián, o sea que ya es todo un donostiarra, y en su país de origen es de Honduras, y en su país de origen estudió enfermería, tenía una formación eh, orientada al cuidado de personas y de hecho tiene mucha experiencia en, en, en ese campo y entonces ha intentado aquí continuar con esa experiencia y hacer un poco, poco lo mismo y se ha encontrado con determinadas cosas que es lo que nos, van a, nos lo va a contar ahora. Mario, ¿nos cuentas un poquito tú? Gracias. Buenas tardes, eh, tengo 30 años, nací en Honduras... Eh, el 14 de abril del 85. Eh, estudié auxiliar de enfermería en mi país pues con el objetivo de, de, de brindar un, un cuidado más especial a mi padre que parecía, padecía una esclerosis múltiple. Eh, lamentablemente solo duró eh, seis años, el 2010 muere. Inmediatamente comienzo a trabajar. Eh, trabajo un año en una clínica privada y en un hospital público, pero no me sentía cómodo, entonces decidí, pues, eh, sentía la necesidad de trabajar en lo mismo, pero en otro sitio donde no eh, fuera donde estuvo mi padre. Me sentía incómodo. Entonces eh, decidí venir a, a España. Llegué en el 2011, eh, empecé a moverme por, por pueblos de Navarra, eh, fui a Barcelona. Y bueno, en Barcelona, más que en otros sitios, eh, en vez de encontrar oportunidades, encontré mucha más competencia. Decidí volver al a pueblo de Navarra, en Bastán específicamente. Y bueno, eh, de un lado para otro veía que no encontraba eh, salida a mi situación, buscaba trabajo, no había porque no tenía documentación. Tenía que esperar esos tres años que piden como requisito principal y el contrato. Entonces, eh, pues por medio de un amigo decidí buscar el sitio más cercano que no fuera tan complicado en Sebastián en Sebastián called Otsaldi, uh, we could uh, sleep at night and in the morning we had to wake up and uh, look for something to do, look for a work. And at a certain point I was arrested by police and, and they wanted to send me back to my country and then I asked for aid uh, and help and uh, I started to uh, study, make courses, so that afterwards, uh, when I want, if I want to have my residence permit, uh, they could see that I am someone who tries to learn and so on. But everything was difficult, and I had to start from scratch again because they couldn't, they, I couldn't have the convalidation with the studies I had done at school back at home. So I started from the ESO, uh, which is a part of uh, our school program 
from here. And um, I had to study again from scratch. Um, I also had to pay a 500 euros uh, fine. I'm still paying it because I don't have enough money. And I'll be paying it for a while. So I asked for them to, to let me pay each month 20 euros. Now, thank God, I am working, I can pay for these 20 euros a month. When I got my resident uh, permit, I was glad, of course. And then I started studying again because uh, my license, uh, my degree uh, in nursing is, not, uh, is useless here. So I started something similar here. Entonces, ahora estoy a las puertas de iniciar las prácticas. And now I am about to start working. Y para el primero de marzo estaría totalmente vencido. My residence permit is almost over, but this week I found a night job. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to to do the, the work. Uh, well, I wasn't able to do the work before because my uh, permit was over, but now I can do it. I am uh, working now, and I hope that some more doors will open for me and that things become uh, easier for me uh, professionally. Well, of course, I didn't tell you the endless complications that I had here, living here in San Sebastian. I found many, many good people, but also people who weren't that good. And uh, we're still fighting. Gracias, Mario. Lo has contado muy bien. Nos hacemos una idea. Thank you, Mario. You told it very well. This is, in short, uh, your story in a nutshell of the crazy things you had to go through. And if you insist, sometimes you get it. You've insisted, and some doors are opening for you right now. Afterwards, if you want to ask questions to Mario, we'll have the opportunity after all the speakers uh, speak speeches will open the floor to the audience for questions and answers if you want to know more about a particular topic. I introduce you Abdel Ila, and uh, he's also been in Spain for seven years, three in San Sebastian as well, and he would love to work in uh, hotels or restaurants, anything that would bring him stability and a minimum well-being. He's also been through difficulties and tell us your story, whatever you want to say about your experience and how it's like to arrive here and try to work. Hello, I'm Abdel Ila Gnouni, I come from Morocco, I'm 39 years old. My story here in Spain started seven years ago. I've been almost four years in Valencia, Catalonia, and three years here in Guipúzcoa. My story before I came to Europe from Morocco, I'm sorry, my Spanish is not very well, but if you have questions about what I'm saying, I'll try to rephrase it. You can ask. Uh, so I have... Um, uh, I have a degree in history and a master's, and I have a state's uh, PhD in history in Morocco. But since uh, we have uh, economic difficulties in Morocco, I couldn't find work there. I didn't have a grant to finish my studies back home. And I had the opportunity um, to go to France, and they said, well, you can go to France and do some sort of exchange, and I say, okay, yes, because that's an opportunity. Uh, and that's what I did. I was in France for almost four years, but it was complicated 
Actually, uh, in France, it's very, very difficult to get papers. In Spain, it's very difficult. It's three years, but in France, it's 10 years to get your papers. So I said, well, Spain is just three years. In th after being here for three years, you can get your papers. So I decided to come here to Lerida in Catalonia. I didn't find any job, and it was the same at, uh, the, uh, at Valencia, you know, the, uh, uh, that place. And I've been working there for a long time, that I worked. Um, at the fields, at the crops, uh, oranges, uh, cauliflowers. Uh, different, uh, different things. And I was paid four euros an hour. So I worked for 40 euros. 10 hours a day. So, and I was like that for, for many years, and it was uh, a lot of suffering. It's very, very hard in Valencia. And I'm never going to forget this in my life. You start at 7 in the morning. And uh, people really take advantage of you, paying four euros per hour. And you have to work there for nine or ten hours a day. That's what I had to do to pay my rent, to buy food, and also trying to regulate my situation, to, to get my papers. But after five, four, six years, they still want you to work there, that's fine, but they don't want to give you the papers. They don't want to give you a contract, a working contract. And now I was trying to find for a proper job, but I couldn't manage to find one. Uh, their bosses don't pay uh, taxes. I mean, there are not very good things that are done there. And uh, then I decided to come to Gipuzkoa, to San Sebastian. Thanks to people here in Donostia, San Sebastian, things improved a lot for me. And I mean, I was suffering for almost one year uh, on the street. I was uh, sleeping on the at, at the uh, ATMs, you know, in the banks. Uh, and and then I went to Otaldi, close to Caritas. I was there for four or five uh, months, sleeping there. And after what, uh, thanks to the social service of the Red Cross, Caritas, and so on. Uh, who helped me a lot, I improved my situation and I managed to enter a flat from the Red Cross. And then I could rent finally a room here in San Sebastian. And it's thanks to these people in San Sebastian and in Gipuzkoa, in the Basque Country in general, who help, really, really help people who live on the street, the homeless. Now I'm fine. I've uh, improved my situation really and I'm going to have I have my residence permit I don't have a working permit but I'm looking for a work uh, offer uh, for a job and it's very difficult to, to have that of course but at least I have my residence permit I also want to get my driving license and I think that when I get it things will be better and what I'm living here in in Spain uh, includes very bad things, but also very good things. And it's so much better here in San Sebastian, in Gipuzkoa in general. And I think that's all I wanted to say. Maybe you can tell us, because not all of us know what you have to do to be able to work. What's the mechanism here? What do you need? You need to have a resident permit, right? And then you need to have a 
certain, a contract for a certain period, or what do you need to have this uh, working permit? Well, thanks to the Red Cross uh, Social Service, they've helped me to uh, have this uh, residence permit, but not a work permit. And to have the working permit as well, I need a pre-contract for one year in order to have a residence and working permit, both things. But right now, I just have the residence one. So you also need a one-year working contract, a pre-contract. Yes, that's it. It's a pre-contract. So they engage to give you work for one year so you can get your working permit, right? Yes, that's it. And I want really to thank people from here in Gipuzkoa, in San Sebastian, in the small Red Cross and Caritas social services. It's really thanks to them that my situation has finally improved. And I'm telling here, I'm here telling you my story. Thank you. Thanks to you for telling us your story, which is really interesting and which uh, helps us see how difficult it is to have a living for people coming, coming from abroad. And uh, I'm sure there are many things you're not telling us because you didn't have enough time. And there are certainly many, many more things and you could talk for hours and hours. Unfortunately, we don't have more time. And uh, these are just uh, glances to your stories. And it would be great if you could tell us much more to have a real idea of how hard it is to come here and start from scratch. We have another guest this evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, Meneses, did I say it right? He comes from Angola. You've been here less than your friends, one year and a half. And you left your country with uh, the idea to work, to improve your life and to find new places and new worlds that would help you. Good evening. I am Meneses. I come from Angola. That's basically it, what you said. I came, to, I came to Spain to find a living, to improve my life. But I haven't been here for a long time. And I don't have the necessary requirements to get the papers. So right now, I am part of the Caritas program which is uh, where I live and I'm waiting to, for the right moment to get my pa pa papers and then move on with my goals. I wanted uh, to tell something about my story. I come from a country, Angola. I don't know if you all know this country in Australia, Africa, in sub-Saharan uh, Africa, where we had a 35 years conflict, a lot of years, and I had to escape. I had to flee my country in the 90s. I came to Spain and then I went to other places in Europe. When the conflict was over, I went back to my country. And at the beginning, things were all right. And then some groups started to protest against uh, the uh, government actions. Uh, there are many uh, problems in these regions, as you may know. And we were part of an organization called Civic Association of Gavinda. And uh, we went to places where the administration, states or governments, uh, administration didn't arrive. But our system is very complicated. And they treated us as politicians, which we were not. And they started to think that we were politicians and we had problems. The association was became illegal, was illegalized by them. And I had to escape, and I went to Casablanca in Morocco, then to Melilla, then Malaga, from Malaga to Leida, and finally here in San Sebastian. I arrived in San Sebastian, and I stayed here because you have a beach, and I need the beach. And that's why I decided to stay here. And here I am. I don't have much to say because I haven't been here for a long time yet. Um, I mean, this Caritas program, 
Perdona que te interrumpa. So, excuse me to interrupt you. What's the process? Since it's uh, more uh, recent for you, when you arrive, what's the process you have to undergo? When you arrive here, where do you go? What do you do? What's your first contact? What's your first need? The first requirement you need to fulfill to stay. Well, the, the first need is always a, a, a social aid or support. Uh, well, the first thing would be food, of course, and then sleeping, because I have slept in the street, of course, uh, when I arrived, I have slept at the Cursal, uh, the, the, co the Congress uh, Hall uh, terrace out there. It was, of course, uh, in summer, but then in 2014 was a very hard winter, and that's when I headed to the Caritas and Red Cross services where they explained me, the technicians there explained me that there were things I could do, what their resources are for people in my situation. But there is a process for these resources that takes a long time to have right uh, to certain dignity, shall we say, conditions. And um, I am studying, I am preparing for the ESO school program, and I wanted to be at a better place where I could do my homework. And when you start doing your homework, if you're not focused, it's very complicated. But I still have to wait for the decision uh, till they have the resources. And I live in a flat with 42 people, 42 men, and I am fine. I'm fine. Each one have uh, have their own problems, social problems, other kinds of problems. And sometimes there are unkind situations, of course, so it's difficult sometimes for me to concentrate to study. But uh, I just arrived, so I don't have much more to say. Thank you very much. And thanks to you for sharing your vision with us, your vision of the situation in which we are. And I hope that you can gradually improve your, your situation and achieve all your goals in our city. Now we're going to hand the floor to our special guest, to Joanna Necker. She's an anthropologist, an excellent one. Uh, she lives in Canada, am I right? Yes. She's a sociologist. She has uh, been a researcher for a long time in social topics related with youth, migration, and the social problems these children face, uh, children populations. And she works in the national and international spheres, and she's very much engaged with, with uh, people in difficult situations, with especially children and young people, migrants. She combines uh, research with the academic world. And she's going to tell us uh, about her vision as a sociologist. Anneke, you have the floor. Buenas tardes, Arancha Leo. Good evening. I'm delighted to be among you. The stories told by Mario and Abdila and Menes reflect common themes of many migrants. They speak of loss, they speak of family left behind, they speak of staggered migration going one place and then another and then another. They speak about uh, the difficulties in terms of having employment, um, being able to continue in a professional career for which you have certification. These are some of the common experiences of many migrants. They are immigrants. This is the way that they have come here. Uh, we also have refugees, and I think it's important to start with that distinction. Immigrants in general are pulled to someplace new. They come before, because of economic opportunities. 
they seek a better standard of living, perhaps they have family living in another country, another part of the world. For refugees, it's a little different. Refugees are pushed. Refugees have to flee. They have to flee economic strife or civil strife, civil war, war between countries. They flee environmental devastation. So it's often a very abrupt departure and it is a loss of everything that is known. It is a loss of everything that is familiar. It is a loss of family. There are people left behind. Uh, there is a loss of uh, any kind of certainty. Uh, there is a vast unknown. Uh, it takes an enormous amount of courage to make that decision to venture into the uh, unknown. Uh, in many cases, uh, refugees have witnessed atrocities. They have seen killings. They have been severely traumatized by these events, and that's often an impetus for leaving. Now, it's really important, even as we make the distinction, to also reflect on the fact that sometimes immigrants come as well from war-affected zones. So some of their experience may be akin to those of refugees. When we talk about the experiences, we tend to look at pre-migration factors, what was life like uh, back home. We speak of the migration process itself. It makes a difference where people go. It makes a difference how they travel, the experiences along the way. Um, often we find uh, that it's uh, staggered migration. Uh, it's not a direct route. Uh, there are uncertainties. Uh, often you're in limbo for quite some time. Uh, we see family split. Sometimes it are the men who immigrate or migrate first, uh, leaving their families behind. Um, sometimes it's a family that migrates all at once. Then we also speak about the resettlement process itself. We speak about adaptation. Um, in Canada, where I live, we speak about integration. Uh, for us, because uh, we are uh, a country of immigrants, uh, we are 34 million strong. Every year we welcome a quarter of a million immigrants, new immigrants. We also have about 22,000 refugees that we welcome to become part of us every year. Uh, in this last year uh, and current times, we've more than doubled that because we also want to welcome our Syrian refugees. So we are a very, very complex, diverse society that is based on immigration. Um, we have, of course, our Aboriginal populations as well. Now, what happens in Canada is our cultural, national, linguistic, religious diversity is highly concentrated in our major cities. I live in Toronto, there's also Montreal, and there's also Vancouver. So most of the newcomers to our big country come to three cities. The city where I live, the city of Toronto, is a population, depending on how you define the boundaries, of about 4.2 million. More than half of our population was born somewhere else. That gives you some idea of the complexity of our society. Uh, we speak over 170 different languages any, different, any day of the week. Uh, you can hear that in our subways. So we have some experience, we have some knowledge about how to optimally welcome, how to um, help with the resettlement and also the integration because our newcomers, and we call them newcomers, become us. So, um, even if there are similarities across all migrants, um, our refugees uh, also have um, special challenges because their departure is non-voluntary, they're separated from loved ones, they have a difficult integration or migration trajectory. It's often a long and perilous journey, uh, and then they have to deal with the immigration and refugee system, which varies in different countries. And uh, you've all spoken eloquently about some of the challenges that have to do more with us. You know, the rules that we make, the obstacles that we create, the the possibilities that we envision. 
Just to give you some sense of some of the resettlement challenges, and I've listed them, and, and, and um, please let me just read through them. This is based on 30 years of research <laughs> with colleagues straight across Canada, so I've tried to synthesize what we know. Uh, for all migrants, uh, what they initially experience is a rapid decrease in their socioeconomic status, in their economic well-being. That's very, very rapid. It's immediate. And on average, it takes uh, a family of migrants 11.83 years to regain the same status that they left behind. Now, if you think for a moment, that's an average. That means that for some people, it is the next generation or the next generation. So the hope is often that the children will do better that they have sacrificed, they will do everything for their children. That's their duty as parents. But sometimes, you know, it might be the grandchildren. Lack of recognition of foreign credentials is really important. If there is one, one key message about what you can do to optimize successful integration of um, migrants, jobs. Recognize the foreign credentials. Make it possible for people to earn their living and to take care of their children. What we often find is that migrants are underemployed or unemployed, and that translates into financial stress. It translates into working double shifts, sometimes triple shifts. What we find in Canada, ironically, is sometimes it are the women who are able to get the first job, and that sounds good, but depending on the part of the world that you're from, that could be an immediate gender role reversal. And that's an example of how migrants also um, are put in a situation where they need to adjust. Um, you know, in some places it's the man that's a breadwinner, suddenly it's the woman that is bringing the money. This is different than back home. Um, so that's, that, that's another thing that can happen. Uh, language. Language is really important. Um, one of the things that we do in Canada, uh, we spend a lot of um, attention to, we devote money to it, is English as a second language. It takes a while to master a language as complex as uh, English. I know Basque is even more complex. Um, but um, how do you do that? Uh, even if children pick up facility in the language very quickly, it's not deep knowledge, so you need sustained language and it needs to be in the schools. It needs to be brought into the schools and that's what we do. Ironically, what we have found is where you retain the heritage language, children also start to perform better academically. It's having the one language plus English, they actually have high um, academic outcomes. But what do you do with the parents? The parents are trying to work, they need the jobs, so we bring the language opportunities to where they are. Uh, we pay transportation to get there. Um, another best practice is having daycare so that children can be brought and taken care of. Culture shock is another big one. Um, the society, the, the traditions, the values uh, can be very, very different than where people come from. Uh, and sometimes so different that there are big differences in values uh, that people need to negotiate. Um, people can adapt, they can acculturate, uh, they can integrate um, at different rates. Um, we leave it to be a choice. You can literally live in Toronto and speak only Greek for 30 years if that's what you wish because you can live in a place where the bank teller will speak in Greek and the baker will. So um, there, there is an element of choice and possibility, um, but sometimes it are the younger ones who acculturate more quickly than, of course, the grandparents, and, and that can uh, raise some, some tensions. Um, and a big one is often parent-child reversal. Suddenly it is the 12-year-old who is negotiating, who's interacting with this completely different social system because they speak the language and their parents don't. So there's a reversal of the parent-child relationship. Key lessons from research. What happens after our immigrants and migrants arrive 
matters at least as much and sometimes more than everything that they have gone through to get there. Now think about that. What happens at the point of arrival when they are with us in our country has often much greater impact on their well-being and long-term success than everything that they have gone through before. And that includes refugees with war experience and war trauma. So in Canada, what we often speak of is, what is the warmth of our welcome? What are our responsibilities to the newcomers, especially those who seek refuge among us? When it comes to war-affected populations, the key is return to normalcy. That seems to be a general thing that works well. Let the children play. Let the adults work. Find that stability, facilitate that stability for them. Labor market integration, find a job, language acquisition, education for children is key, access to health care, of course. Another key lesson that the well being of the children and youth of immigrants and refugees is very much affected by the well being of the parents. So when you address the concerns of the parents, the needs of the parents, you directly affect their children. So we've talked about pre-migration experience, uh, we've talked about migration experience and resettlement experience, uh, all are important. The selection process in terms of immigration and, and settlement, uh, or immig immigrants and refugees is very important. Um, the status, you know, what do we make of that distinction? Um, the country's resettlement policies and programs and practices. What are the attitudes in the receiving society? Are newcomers welcome, or are they seen as the other? Sometimes uh, distinctions are made that were never relevant in a place of origin. In Canada, we talk about visible minority status. Um, that is a designation that somebody from Somalia um, has never been faced with. So there are different social statuses and roles. Uh, key determinants of long-term success, the age at immigration or age at migration, uh, so a child of 10 uh, fares differently than a child of, of, of 18, for example. Uh, what resources do families bring with them? What are their support networks? What are the social capital? Those are some of um, the other important factors. Let me tell you a little bit about what has worked well in the Canadian context. And I'm very, very mindful that our country is very different than countries here and from the European experience in many ways. Our country is enormous. We are surrounded by three oceans. We have only one neighbor, and they're usually friendly. It's the United States. Um, so we have a very low population density, even if we're strung out across the border with the United States. Highly urbanized, um, but lots of room, lots of natural resources, uh, a very well-to-do society. So it's a little bit different. And we also see ourselves as a nation that is diverse. That is, in fact, our identity. Uh, we've all come from somewhere at some point in some generation. Uh, we also cherish our indigenous populations. So uh, it's a very different context. Europe has, of course, a deep history, uh, strong national, regional, local identifications, borders that have changed over time through wars and civil wars, more densely populated, at a, and it's also in a different geophysical space. And I think that's really important when we start talking about the Syrian crisis. In Canada, immigration and refugee issues are handled at the federal level. So who comes to the country is determined at our national level. Now, in recognition of uh, Quebec, we have an area that is mostly French-speaking. Quebec has a say in who comes to live in that province because they're very concerned about maintaining the French language and they are supported in that. So say, well, if you would like people from Haiti, of course. If you would like people from Morocco, of course. Uh, and increasingly, other provinces have a say in that. Uh, education and health are at the provincial level so that it's their mandate. Um, and th the provinces receive settlement funding from the federal government, from our tax base. So there is also devoted funding 
actually to facilitate the integration, the resettlement and integration of immigrants. There's also an entire voluntary sector and there are also different ethno communities, ethnic communities involved. Now, our migrants settle in the urban areas, in the cities, so of course it affects the cities and the municipal um, level of government is involved in very practical ways. For example, public health. Public health takes care of, uh, of, uh, of many things. So there's a partnership across our levels of government. Uh, there's involvement of the non-governmental sector. Uh, there's also direct involvement of um, communities. And it are often the like ethnic communities who are most instrumental uh, in terms of the rapid integration. We have different types of categories of refugees in Canada. Um, the previous government uh, increased the, the variety, uh, but basically uh, we do have government assisted refugees. These are our refugees that are selected overseas in the refugee camps and they come to Canada. Uh, they are um, provided with full health care coverage uh, for on an interim basis uh, and they are their settlement is facilitated. We also have privately sponsored refugees. Um, a faith community can undertake to sponsor a family uh, for a number of years. And then we have refugee claimants and asylum seekers. Uh, these are people who arrive at our borders at our airports. Um, so we have our refugee claimant population as well. One thing that has worked very well in a big city like Toronto is a one-stop shop. It's a welcome center where every migrant can go. Uh, they're assisted with getting a health care card, uh, any kind of help that they need in terms of securing a job, um, registering their children in schools, um, rather than have them try to figure out how it all works in our society, we have brought it all together in one place so people can go there and get the resources or be referred. And that has worked very well for us. There are support structures within the schools. Uh, so we even have settlement workers working directly in the schools. Uh, that's where the children are. Um, they are there as resources for the children, for the students. They are there as resources for their families, their communities, the principal, their teacher. Uh, these are people with knowledge of the challenges. They are people with knowledge of where assistance can be found. Um, referral to for war trauma, for example. Um, they're, they're very much connected. And that has worked very, very well. Uh, a lot of effort has also been put into the recognition of foreign credentials to help uh, facilitate uh, the up, uh, obtaining of, um, of jobs. Um, when I reflect on it, there is enormous support for retention of languages. Again, I, I spoke about how we see ourselves as a rich nation in terms of the cultural and linguistic and religious tapestry that we have woven together. So I think it's, it, I, I think that's important because what we do is very much uh, tied in with how we see ourselves. I think um, we're also very cognizant, and this is seldom spoken of, but the benefits that our migrants bring to us. Uh, the enormous uh, social resources, the social capital, the know-how, the linguistic skills, um, and, and often they also meet labor market needs that have been left unfulfilled for, for whatever reason. So. Um, we are, we're very much aware of that. So let's uh, shift then quickly to um, the situation here. Of, um, well, the a global situation, the, the Syrian crisis. It's easily the largest um, humanitarian crisis of our time. Uh, we know that there are uh, almost 8 million um, Syrians displaced within the country of Syria. We know that there are about four and a half to five million uh, on the move. Uh, they are in camps in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, and Egypt. Uh, and of course, as we all know, um, there are flows coming into Europe via um, the southern part, via Greece and via Italy. Um, this is a global issue. It is something that um, affects us all and is very much, uh, I believe, um, 
incumbent on, something that's incumbent on, upon us to address and uh, help resolve. Um, I'm struck that more than a half of our Syrian refugees are in fact children. And when you stop and think about the fact that they're out of school, that they have healthcare needs uh, that have gone unmet, um, and the uncertainty of their future, you wonder about the long-term soliloquy effects of this migration move. Uh, it's a population that has fled because they need to. They have no option, they have no choice. Those who can leave have left. Our attention seems to be on them. Uh, we need to be mindful that there are so many left behind who would want to have the opportunity, um, but who can't uh, make the journey. Uh, how does it affect the children? Well, the family's uncertain future, the children are out of school, uh, of course, confused, scared by the, their experiences. Lacking a sense of safety and home, um, the older children are forced to grow up very, very quickly. Um, take on adult roles, uh, even help support the family. Um, and these are, these are individuals, these are people um, who've lost loved ones, uh, who've, uh, whose whole life has been, uh, has been disrupted in, in so many ways. Our focus now has been on the Syrian refugees, um, but I'd like us to be mindful that in fact in our world today we have over 60 million refugees. Uh, many of whom are in, um, in various camps in uh, Northeast Kenya, in Pakistan, in Chad, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Yemen, Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Thailand, Gaza, of course. Um, 60 million people. There are children being born in refugee camps who know no other lives. Um, so uh, on the global scale, we're looking at permanent refugee cities. Um, so that's, uh, that's a larger context. In thinking about the migrant crisis that faces the European Union, and I'm very cognizant of my distant perch in North America, but I've been following it with enormous interest. Uh, what has struck me is that the European Union is really based on this idea of free movement of people and trade among member states. I don't know, a bit of a notion though, however, a fortress Europe and now there are migrants that are breaching the external border. Uh, so I, I think of it in terms of challenges and also opportunities. Um, and I've, I've, I've kind of worked through what I think are, are some of the key ones. So um, free movement. Well, what it, does it mean if people are breaching uh, the, the borders around the European Union? Um, it strikes me that um, the attention in the European Union has been largely internal. Uh, who's in, who's out? There's been the focus on an EU bureaucracy. Uh, there have been tensions between decision making at different levels. What does it mean in terms of sovereignty and local decision making of, of previously sovereign autonomous nation states? Um, so how, how, where are the tensions and, 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 and what is that? Um, uh, I think part of the experience has also been that there are very real differences in economies and standards of living across the member states. Um, and that we see come into sharp relief when it are countries such as uh, Greece and Italy that themselves are in crisis, are facing crisis, and yet because of where they are, they are carrying the brunt of um, the reception, uh, the feeding, the housing um, of uh, migrants. Um, so now there's a shift from an internal focus to a focus on an external event that is now happening to us uh, in Europe. Um, I think there's been a, a discussion around the equality of member states, but perhaps, um, you know, it's, equality is one thing, but equity recognizes the very real differences across members that I think need to be uh, brought into discussion uh, if we're really talking about fairness and social justice. Uh, I think there's been a focus on cultural, national, linguistic, regional differences across member states, a bit of, um, perhaps a loss if that, uh, a worry about whether that would be at jeopardy. Because people do need to feel uh, a sense of belonging. Uh, and there I see the challenge uh, being what 
does this external event mean in terms of our sense of a collective European identity? Is there such a thing? How are we going to act as a European um, collective? So big question is, how does the European Union member uh, states and the collective respond to the Syrian crisis, both here within Europe and internationally, um, in terms of a response, a collective response uh, to the actual source of the conflict itself. So what does the European response look like? Uh, and what does it say? Is there a European identity? Is that something that will be forged out of this? What does that response look like? What does it mean? How will it be articulated? Uh, who are we? Who are you as Europeans on the global stage? So my three quick questions are, if Europe takes such pride in its commitment to human rights, uh, and that's very much part of um, how it sees itself, if it takes pride in it, how will it actually enact this? In the response, in our response, it's true of all of us, to the migrant crisis, do we choose to see difference? Do we choose to see difference in terms of culture, nationality, religion, uh, and so forth? Or do we choose to see our common humanity? What role will Europe take on the international stage as a global actor to work in partnerships with others to respond to the humanitarian crisis and also to collectively find solutions to the source of the problem? Thank you very much. Eh, muchísimas gracias a Neke que nos ha puesto nos ha puesto la pila sobre todo lo que tenemos que hacer for pointing at what we really have to pay attention to and what we have to focus on and to do. Those basic needs that you talk about, access to education, the possibility to uh, bring your family to your new country, uh, the second generations having more opportunity than the previous ones, and this uh, view of a country full of opportunities, as is Canada, which is not something we're used to. Um, we are generations that always live in the same place, generally, and that's very, it's a very fresh view from newer countries like Canada, which is so interesting. One of the things that struck me most is your vision about how we need to treat uh, immigrant children, how they are the real hope to become citizens, just as the local ones, and the difficulties their parents have to face, uh, language-wise, or how to find a job, or how to access uh, the health system. You've mentioned very, very interesting things, like uh, access to health, uh, health care. We have a wonderful health care system here, but from people for people coming from abroad, uh, it's something uh, that we've talked about uh, for a long time. Do they have a right to that or not, if they have papers or if they don't? And that's key because it's a basic principle. Education and healthcare are crucial just to live. And sometimes we don't realize that this is absolutely necessary. But these are interesting things that you haven't mentioned, maybe, in your contribution. So if, you, if you're sick because you've been sleeping on the street and it's cold, so uh, what happens? It's not just that you don't have a place to sleep, it's that you, you, you can be ill or sick. Uh, and what's happened to you in that situation? Because we just call the doctor or go to the hospital. But what do you do in that situation if you're ill? What are your possibilities? And any of you, uh, or maybe you were not in that situation, I hope you weren't, but if you have, please tell us a bit about that. Well, when I arrived in San Sebastian in 2013, 
I was a bit, uh, I had a flu the first week, so I went to the Red Cross and they opened their doors to me and they took me to the Intel Rondo Health Center, healthcare center. Uh, to be registered and to have my health care card. And they said they couldn't give me the card because I, I was not registered uh, as, as if I was living in San Sebastian. I had just arrived, so I was not registered in San Sebastian as a citizen. And I, I needed that first. So it made the process a bit longer to obtain this uh, card, this kind of service. And this uh, makes us move and meet more people to be registered in the city. And then the institutions accelerate those uh, processes. And the Red, Cro Red Cross did it for me. And a couple of weeks later, I had my card. Maybe it's absurd for me to ask, but to be registered, uh, you need to leave. You have to need to have an address, I suppose. You, you need to live somewhere. Uh, did the Red Cross help you? Did they give you an address where you lived? Yes, when I arrived here, the Red Cross helped me a lot. And when I went to the health center uh, to ask for a card, they helped me. In 2011 or 2012, they had a shortcut, uh, a, a new policy, and I had some uh, problems at first in the Basque country, and they asked me to be uh, registered in the city. And it was difficult to have an appointment with the doctor. So I just, what I have is an emergency card. That's what they gave me. It's some sort of emergency card, but since I'm not registered, I don't have a proper card yet. I just have this uh, sanitary emergency card. It's not a hundred percent because I'm since I'm not contributing, I'm not working, I'm not contributing with my taxes. I don't have that uh, hundred percent card. So I can be assisted by a doctor, but just only when it's urgent, when it's an emergency. Let's say. So just you have an emergency assistance, right? Yes. Now you are the guests, and we would be very glad uh, to answer your questions. If you're curious about anything, if there's something you want to deepen in. And of course, if you want to add something, or if you have questions for the audience as well, or for Anneke herself, um, we would be glad to, and please feel free to, to ask questions. If anyone has something to say, I, you need to talk on the mic in order to have translation. Good evening. My name is Olaya, and I know this problem, this topic, personally, because my partner comes from Senegal, so I know about the migration processes and the difficulties they have to face when they arrive in Europe, what are the different paths they have to go through and so on. And I'm a social worker as well, and right now I'm one of the councillors of the um, town hall in San Sebastian. And I wanted to ask about the job that's done in Canada in the social, in, in the uh, political parties. So, sorry, what can you tell us? Mainly in the capitals, in the main cities, because in San Sebastian, in my uh, party, we've tried many times since last year to create a commission to treat uh, the welcome we give to refugees, not just from Syria, but from Africa, from Nigeria, 
who are being welcome in the city. And uh, as we've already heard this evening, they are assisted by Caritas, Red Cross, emergency services. But it's true But from the public institutions, there's a lack, a terrible lack uh, of uh, means. And every time we propose something, uh, trying to create an experts a commission to improve our welcome with uh, resources, economic resources, uh, housing, integration, and so on, they've always said no. That's always the answer we get. But also, at, uh, to improve, we want to improve also at a uh, cultural level, religion, and so on. I read in the newspaper this morning the interview they made you, and you said that one thing is to be able to, to want to welcome, and another thing is to be prepared to welcome. And sometimes there are cases of, uh, sometimes it's about pol political attitude and by giving, and of giving means, economic means, and so on. I wanted to know what you think about those experts' commissions, about the political parties working together for the same goal. Uh, how do you do this in Canada? Thank you very much. You're absolutely correct. There has to be a will. When there is a will, there is a way. And to make it happen, you do need the allocation of resources. The resources do not need to be a lot. They need to be there. They need to be carefully allocated. Um, so there is a question of resourcing. What happens in Canada is there is funding that is taken directly from our tax base. And it is that funding that is then distributed um, to um, different settlement um, organizations. Uh, in the province of Ontario, there are many organizations. They are under an umbrella. We call it OCASI, the Ontario Council of a Agencies Serving Immigrants. So they are networked together. They are coordinated together. And they are the experts. Um, they are frontline, as you are yourself. Uh, they are very much informed by the experiences of our immigrants and refugees. They are often former immigrants and refugees. So it becomes a question of some resources strategically allocated and in the hands of people who know what best to do with it. Um, in our country, we've had a bit of a discussion about uh, health care insurance for our refugee claimants. I will share with you that uh, it was calculated that the cost to us as Canadian taxpayers of providing essential and emergency care to all of our refugees and all of our refugee claimants was 59 cents. That is much less than half a cup of our cheapest coffee. So um, again, um, it doesn't take a lot, but it does take will. It does take devoted resources, and these need to be put in the hands of people who know what best to do with it. Thank you for your question and all the best to you. There's a sentence I like a lot, which is, we are, all of us are foreigners almost everywhere in the world. I'm a foreigner too, I'm a German, I've been here for 27 years, and I feel, well, sometimes people who come from Germany ask me, how did they welcome you? Was it easy or difficult? I feel I'm completely integrated, and I said, well, there's, there's been discrimination, but positive discrimination. Sometimes I feel ashamed because I've been treated better than people from other provinces in Spain are treated. So there's an image of the German that's well organized, good worker, that doesn't match my the, kind, the way I am, actually, but it's made things certainly much more easy for me. It, it's curious. And I'm very thankful. I'm very, I'm very happy and very much integrated here. And, um, but 
let's focus on the topic. In America, in the American continent, almost everyone are immigrants. Uh, the thing is to know whether they are first generation, second, third, or seventh one. But they, they're not integrated because they're actually, so to say, massacrated the, uh, the local uh, people. Peoples. They've killed them in the past, but they also they brought their um, their illnesses from overseas, which they weren't immune to. So, a lot of people died also for this reason. In Mexico, for instance, in South America, and local populations, indigenous population, um, doesn't almost exist anymore. And here in Europe, we have a very serious problem right now that concerns mainly Germany. Well, it doesn't concern me anymore because I don't live there anymore. But I. Uh, I am informed about the news, and I think that at a European level, we are, uh, solidarity doesn't exist, and it's not possible. And I've seen uh, an article of a village in Germany where there are some military quarters that have been left. Uh, and there's, uh, there are about seven, five hundred uh, refugees in a small village. I mean, you cannot talk about uh, uh, integration there. That's a ghetto, that's all. And, this, and people from this village, the German ones, don't feel at home anymore, and the immigrants are not integrated either. So that's not possible. You need to... to make refugees go a little bit everywhere in the country or mix them, Syrian ones, the ones from other countries as well. And I don't see the solidarity. And there's been a European meeting today. But I don't think they got good results. Some months ago, we saw a picture of the Fuenterrabia airport, and the first refugees were arriving, and there were just th two or three, where you have thousands and thousands of people in Germany. And here they're glad because just two or three arrived. I mean, this is ridiculous. And Spain is an empty country. I travel a lot in Spain. In Castilla-La Mancha, Castilla-Leon, for instance, you have abundant villages. So we have space. If you compare Spain's population to Germany, you have half the population in a country that's twice as big. And people say, oh, we don't have space anymore. We don't have room anymore. No, Spain is huge. And you could have, you could double the population without problem. Just a couple of ideas, that's all. Thank you. Muchas gracias por, por participar y, y enhorabuena por ese recibimiento. Que Congratulations que for the warm welcome we <laughs> give to Germans. At least someone feels at home here. Anyone else wants to say something? Yes, I'd like to, please. Good evening. My question is for Anne as well. Anne, um, you said that in Canada, diversity is uh, perceived as richness, and you're very much aware of that. And I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. First of all, do you, I mean, what's the strategy in a country where international immigration is practically new to start from uh, scratch? I mean, now immigration is perceived everywhere as a threat. How do you do? What do you do to see it as an opportunity? Do we have to wait for a generation? You invest, of course, resources for integration, good communication campaigns. When do things change? And second, uh, I work on, on these topics, so where do you find your inspiration? Because my inspiration, for instance, is Canada. Uh, so I don't know where you get your inspiration from. Thank you very much for your question. Um, I think it starts with seeing ourselves in the other 
uh, recognizing our common humanity. I think that's absolutely essential. Uh, we talk about different kinds of identities. I'm sitting here before you as a Canadian. Uh, I was actually born in the Netherlands. I identify very strongly with my Dutch background. I speak Dutch. I'm married to a Greek. I speak Greek every day. Um, my child is blonde and blue-eyed. When I take him to the Netherlands, I think he's Dutch. <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> um, my cousin is from India. She was adopted as a baby. She's much more Dutch than I am, and certainly much more Dutch than my blonde and blue-eyed son, who's originally original Greek, because his father is Greek, and that's the original color. So what do we see when we look at each other? You know, and do we think that you can only be one kind of thing? I think the key thing in, in Canada, is, as far as I see it, is that we can be Canadian and we can be something else. There's no tension between those two things. You can speak about your ethnic background if you wish, your ethnic origin if you wish. You can also say, this is what I live. In my home, I live a Greek culture. I choose to. I can. I think also Canada, out of necessity, has had to um, embrace diversity. It's just a function of the number of people coming from so many different places. We've made many mistakes, but what we have learned is that dialogue is important. It starts with recognition, it starts with acceptance, it starts with tolerance, but for us, tolerance isn't good enough. We want to push that further. Um, we don't think of them as them, we think of them as us. And it starts quite quickly. Someone spoke about first and second and third generation in Canada, it's the immigrants who are first generation Canadian, Canadians, uh, their children are second generation. You know, in other countries, uh, it's the children of immigrants who are considered first, immigrate, uh, first generation. And in some countries, uh, even grandchildren are never considered local. So I, 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 think, um, I, I think it really boils down to putting emphasis on those identities that we have in common, whether it's a gender identity or a professional identity or a common experience. We choose to look for difference and we choose to look for what we have in common. So I do think it starts with that. And again, the second thing I think is that we often put things as false, um, false um, dichotomies. Uh, you can't be Basque and European, or can you? Can you? <laughs> can you? <laughs> what does that mean? And, and that's why I like to think of every challenge, there, there is a golden opportunity. And unless you are willing to engage with others to concretely address the challenges, you don't get very far. It is through talking, it's through not being afraid of these challenges. And it's also um, incumbent upon us to look outside, not just inside. Uh, the Syrian crisis has an origin, there is a source, there is an issue. You know, so what can we do together as global actors to address the source of the problem and not just focus on the symptoms that we see closer to home? Sí, eh, gracias, Aneke. ¿Alguna pregunta más? Sí. Espera esper un momento, por favor, que llega el micrófono. Estoy de acuerdo lo que, con lo que ha dicho últimamente la señora. Pero vivimos en un caos permanente. But we need, live in permanent chaos. We need in permanent war. And this situation cannot go on. We are talking about the consequences and how to solve the problems. But we don't address the origin, the roots of the problems, the why those problems exist. Why a person from Senegal cannot be happy in his wonderful country facing the, the sea? Why in Angola? 
After all the wars on, or in Sierra Leone, where I was in uh, 97 during the war, where people was starving and uh, where they have incredible natural resources, why can't they be happy there? Because we are at the service of the great big companies, uh, multinational companies in the world. And state are uh, the only one who can support the well-being. I'm talking about democratic states, of course. But states have lost their power today. And it's the companies who have the powers now. Those huge companies who are exploiting the whole Africa, who are uh, making the world suffer, but really suffer. In uh, Jewish and Christian world, we have great uh, revolutions, Renaissance, illustration, then there was Napoleon, and uh, everything changed. But in, in the Arab world, they did never had a revolution. And the black world, if you allow me the word, uh, hadn't a revolution either. So uh, in this awareness degree, as a person, I can uh, belong to a, peep, to a place and fight for it. But we live in constant chaos. And it's not sustainable. What's happening in the Mediterranean, what's having, happening in Libya, uh, and who's uh, leading communications, the press? We have no idea of what has, what's happening in Libya. No one talks about it. And companies are having the uh, petrol barrel at $7 with their bad businesses. There are the Canadians, the uh, United States, everyone's there. The whole Occidental world, the whole democratic world is there. Where's the ethics? Where's the moral? Where's the consciousness? The, conscien the, consci the conscience and the consciousness of, of what's happening there, both things. And I am um, struck but by that lack of uh, conscience. I think we have uh, international organizations, but the only thing that I'm afraid of is a third world war. And the third world war can come due to this lack of consciousness. Because we keep living in this chaos and it's unsustainable. How long is this chaos going to last? What's the solution? Yes, I think that the main problem and where we all have to look is at the respect of the human rights and some basic rights that uh, bring us to very difficult situations in some states. And we have to readdress uh, the issue of how we want Europe to be, what do we want to be, and how do we want to be as European citizens, and what do you, we want to respect and prioritize as European citizens. I think we have to fight for real human rights and that we have to protect the basic rights which are unprotected, as we've seen sometimes. And as soon as you're not European or you try to re arrive in Europe, you don't have the same rights as we do. And the main difference with Canada and the lesson to learn is this possibility to let everyone be European. Everyone can be European. It's not that someone, because he was born on this uh, floor, can be more European than us. And I think Canadians have that vision of this uh, plurality, and anyone can be Canadian. And that's the thing, that's the richness of diversity, to know that anyone can contribute. And we have to think about that in Europe, common identity, how do we want to be as European citizens and respect all the uh, human rights as basic principles, which is probably what we don't do, really. 
we believe that being European implies certain things, but then we realize that we do not grant those uh, rights to people who arrive in Europe trying to simply work as all the rest. So we have to rethink about the human rights protection, which Anneke was talking about, this European identity we wanted to build. How do we want to be as European? And that's where we fail, I think. We believe that uh, Europeans are more than others. And just because uh, we've uh, lived or were born in a place, uh, we can be better or worse than others. And I think that's the mistake. And the new continents or countries like Canada and the United States, they have this idea that anyone can be uh, Canadian, anyone can be um, American. If you work, you can succeed. And I think they are an example for us in this sense. And we should welcome people who want to really be integrated and have a European identity, and who can contribute with so much uh, richness and diversity in all aspects of life. So, if you, do you believe that uh, we lack this as Europeans? Because maybe sometimes you felt that we Europeans didn't, don't treat you as the others or, or not. Or you think there's no difference between uh, people who, have, who were born in Europe and those coming from abroad? Eh, bueno, en, en algunas ocasiones específicas sí que nos hemos... Eh, eh, Certain particular moments, I have personally felt uh, rejected or undervalued. I know they didn't talk in a negative way to me, it's not that, but just in, indirectly, for example, denying me a job or a training. That's when you feel that you are... Uh, that there's a difference, really, that you have a barrier. There's a barrier between you and people from here. I feel privileged because I arrived here, because it's a place where I found uh, people who have uh, lots of good values, who respect, who are tolerant, who have love, patience, and many other virtues. But maybe we need this little plus, which is uh, they have, which they have in Canada, which is empathy. And uh, anyway, I think we've improved a lot here thanks uh, to the improvements applied in the system, yes, but there's still things to do. Thank you, Maria, for sharing with us. Anyone else? Uh, I'm going to have a look at the networks as well, at the social networks. Someone wants to talk here? Yes, of course. Yes, after what the councillor from San Sebastian said, She's working on the social services. Like she said, we don't have the aid and implication of the Basque government and the other institutions. I want to denounce that three weeks ago, I was in Calais, and there are uh, 7,000 people there, 2,000 orphan children, and the harassment of police. I have videos of how they were gassed in the in the in the during the night the extreme extreme right wing have uh, beaten them they've burned places and i had a contact there i have a contact there and well i live in san sebastian the ba the, 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 the boundary is uh, 20 minutes ago and my contact sent uh, four refugees and he told me that he was sending four, four people, but to be aware that there can be uh, an exodus because the uh, French police are asking them to go down to our Spanish peninsula. And on Sunday, I was talking to a lawyer because I brought these four refugees. And they've spent three nights uh, on, in a boarding house and they've left them 
And C E A C, SIAC, uh, intervened. I contacted them, and this afternoon they went to Bilbao. And I want to denounce, because right now, four refugees arrived, but tomorrow it can be a couple with children. There can be uh, another young person, major uh, 19 years old, with a four years old brother who can be feared, uh, afraid to be separated from his uh, minor brother. But that's the reality. Refugees are arriving. We had no space in San Sebastian to let them stay here longer, and SIAC had to bring them in a bus to Bilbao. So, right now, that's the proof. Yesterday, I ate with them and I showed them the bay and they want to stay here in the Basque country, in San Sebastian. They went to the police to ask for asylum today and that's the reality right now, today. Thank you very much for telling this. We would certainly need more collaboration from the institutions and to turn from the theoretical policies to the practical ones. Pedro, in the social networks, is asking uh, whether this European identity exists. Do we have a European identity? Do we feel European? And do we integrate immigrants in this identity? Are they integrated or not? We had more questions around here. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Pedro. I'm the one who asked the question, but I was just, uh, it was just some sort of reflection. And I'm going to talk about something else. I work in education in a professional, basic professional training center in San Sebastian. My students uh, come from Niger, Algeria, Honduras, uh, Romania, Ukraine, and more, maybe probably more nationalities. Many of them are uh, living in different uh, flats uh, given by the government. Um, and I have to face this problem that Mario, Dalila, and Menezes were talking about. I face it many days, uh, many times a day, because sometimes the police comes because there's been, there's been trouble in the supermarket next door, so on. And the re that's a reality that I see and live every day with my students. And I wanted to ask, aren't we hypocritical somehow? Because we ask for more resources for immigrants, more houses, and so on. And the res when the resources comes from our taxes, and if we want to have more resources, that means that we're going to have to pay more taxes. Are we really uh, ready to do this sacrifice, to do this effort, to live a little bit worse so that others can live better? Thank you. Thank you for this interesting reflection. And actually, yes, here uh, we have everything in a nutshell. We want them to be European, but do we want to really help or just a little bit? Till which point are we ready to sacrifice our well-being to safeguard some human beings? It's a difficult to answer question, and I suppose that everyone will have to reflect and think about it. Yes, Annika, please. If I may speak to that, what we have found is um, Toronto, for example, has a, a food bank. It's the largest in Canada. Um, when you look at who comes to the food bank, yes, immigrants and refugees might come for a week, two weeks, six weeks. Guess who shows up the next year to volunteer? They do. Guess who some of our greatest philanthropists are? They are members of our immigrant community who've succeeded and who want to give back. Everywhere we look, we see evidence of success, evidence of striving. If there's anything that a migrant wants to do is to give back. And it's incumbent upon us to make that possible. So yes, it might cost a little, 
but we get so much more. Believe me, there's been research done on this. There have been people who are much more capable than I am in terms of statistical analyses and economics and so forth. Um, but the evidence, at least in Canada, is they give back much more. They use services much less than our native-born population. I think that speaks to the importance of facts, the importance of research, you know, scientific findings, the importance of sharing, because when it comes to attitudes, there are things that challenge our perceptions. They're not exactly the, thing, the way that we think they may. People bring a lot of resources with them. And given an opportunity to succeed, they will. Gracias, Anneke. Eh, ¿Alguna cosa más? Sí, hola. Um, I have got a question for Joanna. Um, first of all, I'm very impressed how everything works out in Canada, how professional the refugees and migrants are welcomed, and I think that's really impressive. But what, really, what I'm really interested in is, do you think that um, Canada could handle the same amount of, of refugees Germany, for example, is facing right now with the same system and the same prof prof professionality? Or how could we compare that? Is, is it even possible? Or I don't know. That would really interest me. Thank you for such a wonderful question. Um, is it fair to compare? No, it's not. Um, the volumes are very, very different. Um, and I, I do not want to make you think in any way that it has all been very easy and that, that there haven't been difficulties and that there haven't been big mistakes, uh, because that certainly isn't the case. What we have learned, we have learned through trial and error. We kept doing it until we got it right, essentially. Um, a lot happens, or a lot depends on the public attitudes frankly. A lot depends on who we elect as our leaders, our representatives in government at different levels. Um, in terms of the current situation in Canada, we've had a recent election and a change of party, a change of government. And uh, through the course of, um, of that election, what emerged at one point was that the vision that we have of ourselves as Canadians was getting lost somewhere along the way. Um, the recent government, the, the new government, has committed to um, welcoming 10,000 refugees by Christmas. It was a big undertaking. Everyone in the settlement sector said, that's great, but it's really important to get this right. So a few weeks will not make the difference for us, but it will make a big difference for the refugees that are coming. Canada has now committed to 25,000, which doesn't sound like a lot. Um, the, the public sentiment in general is, can we, when are they coming and can we get more? Um, I think there is um, a great awareness of the need. Um, of course, um, in Europe, people are much closer to the flow of migrants. Uh, in Canada, we send uh, military planes, we send uh, private planes, uh, privately chartered planes, to go get migrants. Uh, here in Europe, they are um, coming across borders, they are crossing seas, they're coming in very large numbers. So um, I think, honestly, in terms of the, um, the response to the actual migrants coming, uh, Europe faces a bigger challenge at the moment. Um, but I think the solution uh, is a shared responsibility. Uh, and it's as much addressing the source and the different ways uh, that um, the source of, of the conflict occurs uh, as much as, as, as uh, the human humanitarian response to those who have been forced to flee. Gracias, Anneke. Si sí, alguna cosa queríais aportar vosotros a, a nuestros invitados. Creo que todos los sirios tenían que volver a Siria. Primero hay que acabar con la guerra. Y la guerra 
se acaba en una semana o en dos días sin voluntad política de los países. Sin micrófono no la puede traducir. We cannot translate, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Espera, que no tiene micrófono para intervenir. A ver, eh, siempre estamos hablando de las consecuencias. We're always talking about consequences, but let's face the problem. Let's solve the problem. We have to go to the origin. Uncle Sam, we all know who they are. Russia, although Syria was pro-Soviet back then, back in time, as other countries, but that's the key of the issue. And that's what we have to address, the origin, the source. And here, we are powerless. There's nothing we can do here in our society. And in this planet, there are international organizations like UNO, like UNESCO, and other organizations, churches in everywhere in the world of diverse religions. And we have to solve this war altogether. But now, political will, yes, uh, if, we, if there was political will, real political will, in less than a week, this war will be over. And everyone should be able to be happy in their own country. And from the outside, we should help them be happy in their country not exploit them, not uh, crush them, not uh, encourage those wars through the weapon industry and pharmaceutical industry and so on. In this planet, we should all be happy in our home countries, respecting each other and loving each other. And why don't we do that? Yes, we, we wish that could happen, to have everyone stay in their home countries in, with their family. Yes, but the rest is, all the rest is pure paternalism. It's uh, somehow a trick. And it's uh, adding more wood to the fire so that this chaotic system can go on subsisting. It's inhuman, irrational. Thank you very much. We take note of the need, certain need to contribute altogether so that no one has to flee their countries, no one is, is expelled from uh, their countries. And if that happens, which is the case, to welcome the them the best way possible and assuring the the best warm welcome in our countries. Thank you very much. Do you, did you want to add something, Anneke? I think you've said a very important thing. Uh, it's important that we take responsibility ourselves for the source of the problem and be a little more humble in um, our um, thinking that we're doing such a wonderful thing in um, being humanitarian to people who've had to flee. It's the recognition of the responsibility that we also share in the, in the creation of the, of the conflict. Maybe the country won't look the same after, but there are issues there that we also bear responsibility for having created. So I think um, I would say a note of humility <laughs> um, mixed in with um, uh, recognition of the challenges and um, really seeing them also as a golden opportunity to create something strong, to work together uh, here locally uh, with others across Europe and with global partners uh, because uh, we live in a global world and what affects um, us here um, might have a seeming origin somewhere else, um, but it's actually of our making as well. We bear responsibility. We talk about rights um, hand in hand with responsibilities. Gracias. Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for participating. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the San Telmo Museum. Thanks to Glow Governance. Thank you. Thanks to our guests, of course.
Next event will be the 18th March, Real Power of Women in European Policy. Maybe if there were more women in European Policy, human uh, rights would be more respected. Thanks to all of you. Thank you very much for sharing with us your experiences and your vision of San Sebastian. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anneke, for being here. Thanks.